and we are going live. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's live online event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jessica from Greenlight, and we are honored to host tonight's fundraiser event with the Octavia Project, featuring award-winning author N.K. Jemison, as well as project participants. It's always our great privilege to partner with the Octavia Project, which does such wonderful creative work here in Brooklyn. And I'm excited to hand things over to Ray from the Octavia Project in just a few moments. Before that, though, just a couple of housekeeping things. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see and hear you. They can see that you're here though, and there are a couple different ways you can interact with the participants and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like a speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. It's a great way to show your appreciation for the speakers and interact with fellow attendees. We do require that all at event attendees abide by Greenlight's code of conduct, which I'll be pasting in the chat in a moment. And we will remove folks who aren't able to abide by the code of conduct. So I'm putting that in there just for everyone's reference. If you have a specific question that you'd like to have answered, please post your question in the Q&A. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. You can also upvote questions that you think are great to give them a better shot at being addressed in the limited time that we'll have. We're delighted that we have simultaneous interpretation into American Sign Language by America, uh, sorry, by Meredith Devine and Kate Weldy. Thank you so much to both of them. We are also recording tonight's event, so look for video or audio versions on our social media channels later on. You'll hear more in a moment about how you can support the work of the Octavia Project if you'd like to support Greenlight Bookstore, the best way to do that is always to buy a book. If you need recommendations, you can find books by tonight's featured author, N.K. Jemison, and the project's namesake, Octavia Butler, and many others at Greenlight Bookstore, either at our store locations in Brooklyn or on our website. I put the link to browse some of those titles in the chat. So we appreciate so much the support of our community of readers and writers and the opportunity to make space for events like this one. So now I'm going to turn things over to Ray from the Octavia Project, who will tell you a little bit more about their work and about what to expect with tonight's really awesome event. Ray? Thank you, Jessica. So um, welcome again to a conversation with N.K. Jemison, Building Futures with the Octavia Project in partnership with Greenlight Bookstore. My name is Ray Ferreira, and I'm a member of the Octavia Project Advisory Board. Tonight, we are celebrating the Octavia Project's work with young women, non-binary and trans youth in Brooklyn by exploring speculative fiction with our guest, N.K. Jemison. We're excited to share this experience with our community. 
Over the last six years, the Octavia Project has served over 80 New York City youth in our Summer Institute. Each year, we introduce young people to coding, architecture, urban planning, science, and many other disciplines through the lens of speculative fiction. Our participants approach each project by reimagining their city and their world and dreaming of possibilities. The Octavia Project is a nonprofit 501c3 that could not exist without the help of our community, many of whom are present with us tonight. Much of the program is funded with your support and we could not be more grateful. Each year we grow and learn and this year was no different as we adjusted to the reality of a global pandemic and took our Summer Institute completely virtual. This year, we are preparing to launch a new program to serve middle school students, and we will continue to need the support of our generous community to do so. We look forward to coming together to celebrate the success of these programs with you all at the end of the summer. The goal of this evening is to learn, to grow, and most importantly, to have fun. We will hear directly from N.K. Jemison and three of our participants, and we hope that they will inspire you. If at any point during the evening you would like to make a contribution to our work, you can go to octaviaproject.org support. We will wrap up by 9.15, and for each $10 you contribute, to, contribute during tonight's event, you will be entered into a raffle and have the opportunity to win prizes, such as a six-month membership to Libro FM. We hope you enjoy the evening and walk away inspired. To start the conversation, I would like to introduce Octavia Project Executive Director and Co-Founder, Megan McNamara. Thanks, Ray. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm so excited that so many of you were able to join us for this event. I'm Megan and I am thrilled to introduce our featured guest tonight, Nora. Nora, or N.K. Jemison, is a New York Times bestselling author of speculative fiction, short stories and novels who lives and writes in Brooklyn, New York. In 2018, she became the first author in history to win three consecutive Best Novel Hugo Awards, all for her Broken Earth trilogy. She has also won a Nebula Award, two Locus Awards, and is a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Fellowship. In addition to writing, she has been a counseling psychologist and educator, a hiker and biker, and a political, feminist, anti-racist blogger. She has facilitated workshops with the Octavia Project since 2015. Welcome, Nora. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me. And I didn't realize it had been that long. Wow, yes. since 2015. Since 2015. Okay. And wow. All right. Wow. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, if it's, if it's uh, making you feel any better, by the way, I just realized that there are cat treats visible in my background. Um, <laughs> so lots of us have been a little nervous about tonight, but I was thinking I was, oh, I do this all the time. And then cat treats. Anyway, <laughs> hi. So maybe we will get to see a cat at some point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, if Ozzy realizes they're up there, he'll come and try to knock them down. <laughs> That's how he gets the cat treats. Okay, um, so to get started tonight, I thought we could go back in time a bit. Um, so you've spoken before about knowing that you wanted to be a writer from the time you were young. Mm -hmm. um, so could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what drew you to writing at a young age? Um, and specifically, you know, what role did writing play in your life as a teenager? Um, I mean, I began writing when I was maybe eight or nine years old. Um, and it was mostly like, honestly, it was kind of like fanfic because it wasn't like actually rooted on any particular uh, movie or property or anything like that. But I would go and I would watch movies and I would be frustrated because I was like, you know, that plot didn't make any sense, um, you know, or those characters I don't understand why they did that. That was dumb, um, you know, or something like that. And and uh, so I, I started writing because I was frustrated by uh, what I, I was not seeing. Um, and as I got older, that turned into more identity-based what I'm not seeing. Um, I was not seeing stories featuring people who look like me. I was not seeing stories featuring women. Um, I was not seeing stories that, um, you know, kind of even seemed 
to realistically uh, grapple with what people were like. Um, and so for me, it became one of the ways that I could, uh, I guess, explore myself, figure out who I was um, by trying to, you know, kind of just write my, you know, I wasn't doing anything like groundbreaking. I was, you know, 15. Um, you know, there are, there are writers out there who are 15 who are doing groundbreaking work. I was not one of them. Uh, but um so, you know, I was just writing the kinds of science fiction and fantasy stories that I, I loved, but I was just putting people, you know, more like me in them. That was really it. Um, so that was, that was necessary at that point. I wasn't seeing a lot of myself in media. I had to put myself in. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I was going to ask, was it always sci-fi fantasy? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I always jokingly say that I started out uh, reading like children's novels, uh, fairy tales, and I just never stopped. I just aged up the characters as I was going along. Still fantasy worlds. Though. Fairy tales can get very interesting, you know? Yeah. 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 Especially once you get old enough to really dissect them and go into subtext and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Um, so a few years ago, uh, photos of Octavia Butler's notebooks were released from um, her archives at the Huntington Library. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to see that she filled the cover, the inside and outside covers of all her notebooks with um, intentions for herself. So she wrote things like, I shall so be a best-selling be author. This is my life. Yes. So be it. One. See to it. Yes. And that is the best one. Mm -hmm. um, and she also wrote things like, I write best-selling novels, my books will be read by millions of people and things like that. Um, did you have intentions for yourself as a young writer? And if so, have they changed? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, despite the fact that I had started writing in, uh, writing myself into stories, I still kind of quintessentially felt like this was a subversive act. I did not feel like it was a thing I, had any chance of doing commercially. Um, because of course, you know, when I was looking around science fiction and fantasy, I didn't see anybody black. That was just, that was not a thing. Um, you know, there were black authors at that time. I didn't know that, um, you know, I was, uh, you know, a kid and then a teenager going into my local library and I would say, hey, I wanna read science fiction and fantasy. Um, you know, I like science fiction and fantasy. What would you recommend? Um, and I didn't really know how to comfortably ask, um, you know, with black people, <laughs> you know, or, or something like that. Um, and the librarians would do the very typical thing of they would go and look up the, the Hugos and the Nebula winners, and then they would recommend those. Um, and when I read those books and, and, you know, kind of sometimes watched the films made from them or whatever, um, I just didn't see, that was all I saw, you know, and I just figured, you know, I can, I can enjoy this, but it's not for me. Um, I can enjoy science fiction and, and fantasy, but it's clearly not aimed at me. It's clearly not written for me. Um, you know, I can, I can identify with the characters, um, you know, to the degree that any human being can identify with any other human being. Um, but, you know, I obviously don't have any chance of having a career in it. Um, and then I brought a prop. And then uh, when I was like 13, I found this in the uh, little carousel of books, paperbacks in the science fiction section. Um, and I picked it up and I was like, oh, what are you? Man, I'm not super interested in this. Um, it didn't, you know, the cover looks sort of vaguely like, you know, it, it, clearly it's science fiction. Look at the font. The font tells you this is science fiction. Um, um, and, you know, the, the, the character here kind of looked like um, Ripley from Alien. And dad had just taken me to see Alien. I was too young to see Alien. Anyway, um, but dad had just taken me to see Alien. And I was like, okay, I want to read a book about Ripley in space. Um, and so I started reading it. And then slowly I began to realize, well, first of all, this woman in white in the book. So, um, and then I started to realize as I was reading along that this was a story that clearly someone black was telling. 
Um, at no point, nowhere in this, in this volume um, is there a photo of Octavia Butler. In her author's note, it's not mentioned uh, that she is a black person. Um, and, you know, honestly, I don't think there's an author's note in that particular edition. Um, so all I knew was that uh, there was this ineffable sense of meanness in the story. You know, suddenly the story spoke to me in a way that no other science fiction novel I had seen had done. Um, and, you know, that was my first indication that I could do this. But even then, I still didn't try it. Even then I um, went to college and grad school, never really planning to become a professional writer. So, Wow, that's incredible to hear you say, you know, <laughs> where you are now. Yeah, uh, I just, I was trying to be practical, so. Sir, yeah. Um, and that actually leads me to my next question. Um, so I was gonna ask about, you know, it's really been just in the past several years um, and a lot quite recently that Octavia Butler is, finally started getting the attention and the claim, acclaim that she deserves. You know, it was just recently that she made the New York Times bestseller list. Um, multiple books time. being optioned, right, for the first time, just recently. Um, you know, we just saw that Kindred got optioned for a TV show. Lots, lots happening for her finally now. Um, you know, and it's not just Octavia Butler. It seems like bit by bit, some other Black women writers are finally starting to get their due. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think we're seeing a permanent shift in the publishing industry in terms of, you know, who gets represented, who gets the big book deals and the media attention? Uh, we are definitely seeing a permanent shift in who gets published and what kind of material gets published and what the characters look like. Um, and that is just, you know, like finally the, the publishing industry has figured out uh, the, the really obvious truism that um, the readership of pretty much any genre is not just straight white men um, and, and cishet white men. So, uh, you know, I don't know why they ever thought that because it hasn't been that for like ever. Uh, well, not for like decades. Um, but, uh, you know, so the, the readers, oh gosh, I shut, forgot to turn off my uh, texting there. One moment. Um, but, uh, you know, so, um, but the readership has, has never been that. And, and they finally realized they can make money by appealing to like the majority of readers, all readers, and not just a small subset. Um, you know, I always kind of call that the Black Panther revelation because that's, you know, after the film Black Panther made a billion dollars, suddenly, you know, all of these, these various entities started to realize, oh wait, black people have money um, or other people besides the ones that I thought were buying these things have money. Um, what we're not seeing is a change at the editorial level, at the uh, CEO level, most definitely, um, at the publisher level. Um, the people who are the big decision makers in publishing have not changed. And I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, readers push for that. Readers have been um, you know, kind of demanding that their books be better and that this necessitates changes in the decision makers. Um, but, you know, it's hard to kind of tell people with uh, that sort of decision making power that, you know, your decisions are not great and, you know, we want your decisions to be better and you can't do that. You need to hire somebody else who can do better. Um, you know, so. Okay, yeah. Um, and do you think that that, you know, shift that we're seeing in just in terms of even in terms of the books being published, the authors being represented, do you think that at all changes the work of inspiring upcoming BIPOC women writers? Um, I, I do know that it has inspired, you know, like I know I, I've been told by other writers that my work has been inspiring to people, which is great to hear. Um, what, and, and, you know, I know Butler inspired massive numbers of people, you know, there's, there's, it's not just me, um, you know, by any stretch, there are now dozens of us 
Um, and all of us can kind of say that just simply knowing that Butler existed. And, and like I said, there were other writers, you know, Chip Delaney, I think, was the first Black person to get published, um, a Black queer person to get published. Um, and uh, sorry, Samuel Delaney is his publishing name. Uh, he goes by Chip. Um, but anyhow, um, you know, and, and around the time that I was kind of coming up, there were others. There were uh, Tanana Reeve Du, uh, her husband, Stephen Barnes, you know, there were, there were a bunch of, there was a small handful of writers um, at that point. And there's this exponential increase that seems to be happening um, as, as more and more of us realize there is an opening in, in this space for us, more people come in. Um, so that's, that's good to know. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the last half of your question. No, you, you're perfect. Oh. And I would just like to say, yes, you have definitely inspired people. So oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm you correct in saying that for sure. Um, and speaking of inspiring people, um, so in your second book of the Broken Earth trilogy, um, The Opalist Gate, you- I feel like it's a trivia question now. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't know. Okay. Hey, all right. I'll try. No. Um, I'll, I'll read it to you. No quick. Okay. <laughs> um, so this is actually from a note in the acknowledgments. Um, so you wrote in the acknowledgments um, a note about the Octavia Project. Hmm. So you said, quote, to the teens of the Octavia Project who reminded me how far I've come and what all this is really for. Um, so I, was I when completely forgot I wrote this. <laughs> okay. Wow. But thank you. I, I, I'm glad to know that I did. Okay. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could, if you remember, talk a little bit about, you know, what about the teens of the Octavia Project inspired you and why you included them? Um, I think, you know, just every time I've interacted with the, I guess students isn't the word, um, teens, we'll go with teens, um, of the Octavia Pro Project, every time I've interacted with them, their ideas have been so wild and, and just out there and nothing is stopping them from feeling like they're capable of expressing those ideas and taking them somewhere. Um, and I love that. Uh, you know, I think about the fact that, you know, I, I looked at this and just simply decided, you know, I can't possibly ever match that. Why would I try? I didn't try. Um, and I, th I see that they're going to try. Um, I see that they are helping each other. I see them supporting one another. I see them um, welcoming each other into a space that they have created and which to me, it seems like they're defending and, you know, kind of keeping strong. Um, and that is what you need to make it in this business. So, um, you know, whether they take it into the creative professional world or whether they take it into the business world or whatever, um, they're, they're developing the skills and the strengths that they need to, to um, change the world. And that's awesome. Wow, yeah, I, I agree. I think they are also going to change the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could use that. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I want to get back to the topic of your writing um, mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about process. Um, so to start, I was wondering, um, maybe you could tell us, you know, are there certain questions that you ask yourself as you're starting to develop um, the foundations of a story? You know, maybe how do you know it's going to go somewhere? Um, and how do you help it get there? Uh, there's a there's a kind of loosey goosey piece to this that uh, I don't know if uh, I don't know if I can articulate. Um, I'm much better at expressing myself in writing than I am in verbal stuff. But um, there's a feeling that comes to me when I know I've got a good idea. Um, and sometimes that feeling kind of comes and then sort of fades, you know, which tells me you've got a good idea, but you're missing some pieces. Um, you've, you've got a good idea, but you need the characters or, you know, here's a good plot, here's a good world, or here's a character, you need a place to put this person in. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's I, I sort of jokingly call it a ping, um, but like there's this little in the back of my head that tells me it's not that bad I don't want to sound 
strange, but uh, I'm very strange. Anyway, um, but you know, there's a there's a feeling that I get, um, and that tells me that I'm I'm on the right track. Um, sometimes the pieces, you know, come quickly and form like Voltron, and then I'm like, oh, okay, I've got a new idea. Um, sometimes they sit for years. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about this uh, in, in other interviews, but with uh, the Broken Earth stuff, um, I attended a, a NASA sponsored workshop called uh, Launchpad many years ago. Um, and we had some interesting conversations there. And one of those conversations turned into a ping. Um, and then I've always had a fascination with geophysics because as one does, um, I like volcanoes and I cannot lie. Um, okay, that, that was terrible, I'm sorry. Um, but I like volcanoes, I like mountains, I like, you know, I like earthquakes. She says, as a person who grew up in a completely geologically stable place, um, I am pretty sure that Californians and Hawaiians and so forth kind of hate me right now, but, um, but you know, I, I, the idea of earthquakes, the idea of the earth moving, the awesome power of that was, has always been fascinating to me. Um, and I finally did get a chance to feel an earthquake like a few years ago when one hit New York. You remember that was like maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, it was great. I remember that. It was, yeah, it was terrifying. Because we were like, we don't get earthquakes. So yeah, like, well, I mean, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My boss ran into my, because I still had my day job at the time. My boss ran into my office and stood in the doorway and was like, we've got to get out of the building. Um, this building isn't built for, you know, nothing in New York is built for earthquakes. And I'm like, nah, it's a subway. What are you talking about? It's just the subway is harder than usual right now. Um, and then of course, you know, we all got outside and, and boss was immediately like, hey, no line at five guys, let's go. <laughs> so, um, this is how New Yorkers respond to earthquakes. Um, but all that said, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated by that. So that formed a ping. That's been a ping my whole life. Um, and then I had a dream at one point. Um, and in that dream, I found my character. Um, she was an angry person who had incredible power. I needed to answer the question of why she was so angry. Um, so all of that kind of eventually formed, but it took years, really. Um, and also there was the part of it that uh, I didn't feel like I had the skill to write it for a while. Um, when the, the idea kind of, when it started to gel into an idea for me, um, like there was a while where I didn't write it for, you know, maybe about a year. I didn't actually write it because I didn't think I had the skill to handle um, a story of the complexity that I was starting to imagine. And when I started writing it, I didn't think that I had the skill to handle it, but I kept going. Um, and, you know, actually I, I had a sort of minor crisis at one point partway through writing the story. Um, where I, I decided that I was doing a terrible job. Um, you know, the second person was too wild. Um, nobody is gonna want to read a book that's partially in second person. Everybody hates second person. Um, I'm doing it in present tense too. That you know, how much more pretentious can you get? Um, you know, that was what the story felt like it needed. But I I felt like you need to be a much better wordsmith to be able to master those things. Um, and I didn't feel like I had the, those skills. And you know, my my editor at the time um, kind of gave me a mental slap to the head and, and told me to calm down and eat a Snickers. Um, and then I got over it. But um, but you know, it took a while. It took a while. It took a lot. And you mentioned um, in there, you know, sometimes it's a character, sometimes it's a world. I was wondering, yeah, sort of how do the processes of world building, character development, plot development, how do those sort of play off of each other? You know, is there a sequence? Is it always one leads to the other? Do they kind of happen simultaneously? Um, well, okay. So uh, one of the things that I have done with the Octavia Project for the last few years was I've given my world building workshop. Um, and the world building workshop is a wonderful tool um, I'm sure you can find iterations of it online, um, but with that world building workshop, it's a great tool for sort of generating ideas or generating um, a milieu in which you can then play once you've developed a character, once you've developed a plot. 
Um, but I don't actually normally start with the world myself. Um, usually I start with a character. Um, I, I tend to be a character focused writer um, and, and answering character questions and fulfilling character arcs is the focus of what I, I do. Um, you know, I'm always a little surprised when people tell me that they think of the broken earth as an environmental uh, story um, and that my purpose was trying to explore, um, you know, human interaction with the environment. I'm like, that was no, that was the background. Um, my purpose was trying to explore uh, a, a character, um, a particular character. And um, that is always my, my first and foremost interest. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, so I think we're going to pause here for now um, so that we can get to the next part of tonight's event. Um, but I did just want to thank you for this conversation, Nora. Um, you're an inspiration to all of us at the Octavia Project. So thank you. The thank you because they are inspiring to me in turn. So good. Mutual. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to hand it back to Ray now who's gonna tell us about the next part of tonight's event. Um, and Nora will hear more from you in just a bit. Great, thanks, Megan. And thank you so much for that, Nora. I feel like we got some really valuable insight into your process. Um, now we will be joined by, by three participants from the Octavia Project who are all writers themselves and you've all worked with uh, Nora before in exploring speculative fiction. Also joining the discussion is Daphne Lundy a member of the Octavia Project Advisory Board who will be moderating this discussion. If you have any questions for Nora or our teens, feel free to add them to the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. And again, that is the two little um, bubbles at the bottom of the screen. Thank you so much, Ray. Good evening, everybody. I'm really excited to be with, with you all virtually. Um, so to first kick off things, I'd love it if the Octavia Project participants can introduce themselves. So I'm going so to ask the three of them to tell us um, their name, how old they are, um, what borough they're from, uh, how long they've been involved with the Octavia Project. And I would love to hear what folks are excited about doing um, once, we're out, once we're out of the uh, pandemic, aka panorama, quarantine. What are folks looking forward to doing um, once we're, we're past that? Um, hello, uh, my name is Afra Mahmoud and I'm 16 years old. Um, I currently live in Queens um, and I've been with Octavia Project for one year now. And um, once the pandemic is over, I am very much so looking forward to seeing my friends and probably hugging everyone on site. Same. Hi everyone, my name is Kaylee Ortiz. I am turning 16 this weekend. Whoop, whoop. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm from Brooklyn. I am a sophomore currently, and oh, um, I'd love to share my baking recipes with my friend, um, my friends, and just hang out with everyone. Hi, my name is Amalinda, and I live in Brooklyn. And I've been in the Octavia Aquatic for about two years now, and I'm looking forward to go outside and just enjoy the sun and everything that is in it. It's just, I'm just waiting, yeah. Thank sorry, you so much. sorry, I just wanted to say I've been with Octavia Project for three years, so. Thank you so much for those introductions. And I'm, I have to say, I'm looking forward to many of the same things as well. Um, so my first set of questions is gonna be for Kaylee, Amalineta, and Afra. So the first question is, what are the three words you associate with the Octavia Project and why? Um, well, I think for me, the three words I uh, coincidentally begin all with C, um, comfort, creativity, and confidence. Um, comfort, because I think um, the Octavia Project has been one of the most um, like safe and stress-free environments I've ever been in, um, not just because of the teachers, but also the students and the way everyone is um, non-judgmental to each other. Um, creativity, because of course, um, this environment is um, created to foster every type of strange thought that might come into your head that usually you would probably be judged by um, normal people, but you know, being normal is boring. Um, and confidence, because I think 
I have never had as much confidence as I did by this um, program in not just my writing, but myself as well as a woman of color. So for me, um, I would describe Octavia Project as an uplifting fun, just like, like Alfra said, um, a very safe and loving community. It really taught me a lot of things about self-love and just being in a lot of toxic situations with friendships and being in a really hostile environment in middle school, like not accepting, you know, you know, me as being my weird self. Um, it was just nice to be in such a wonderful community that just accepted me for me and influenced a lot of what I do today and pushes me to be a better person. Um, for me, I would describe the Octavia Project as fun, creative, creativity, and addictive. Because I feel like once I was there, I was able to be myself and have fun. And like once I knew art, but like it got me into knowing more about it and just put myself into art. And I felt like it was my space. I didn't have to wonder whether or not other people was wondering about who I am, what am I doing here? And I feel like I was being me. And so, yeah. Thank you so much for those thoughtful answers. Um, I love the idea of creative spaces, spaces where you feel it's okay to be weird. So thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that. Um, so the next question I have for the three of you is, how has the Octavia Project and meeting authors like Nora um, helped shape your creativity as writers, as artists in your own practice? I'd love to start this one. Um, whenever NK comes in, it's just such a burst of like inspiration. And it, no, it really is. I see your face. It, it, it's, it really is a blessing to meet artists like yourself. And it really like teaches me how um, it takes a lot to be successful as a writer. I know um, NK as such an intellectual woman, it took her so long to finally get her first book or trilogy published. And I've been afraid of failure for a very long time, but um, seeing NK and her writing really does inspire me to, you know, apply to those contests and, you know, just give writing a go. Um, for me, I feel like every time I meet Noah, I feel like, I just get to believe that I'm gonna be a good writer and like no matter how hard it is, no matter how it's gonna be hard. Cause I feel like I hate, I hate those words where writing is not a career. It's just something you kind of do to have fun. Cause like, it's hard to just put a book out there and be like, it's gonna sell and I'm gonna be good at it, you know? And I feel like I believe that I'm gonna be able to make something out of my art no matter how hard it is, I just have to be patient and all that. And I felt like, yeah. Um, yes, 100% agree with uh, Kaylee and Amala Neda. Um, I've only had the opportunity to meet Nora once, um, but it was so incredible. Like I cannot explain to you um, how impactful um, like the workshop you did with us was. Um, it in inspired my writing so much to the point that I actually joined a, um, a writing program to teach 10 to 13 year olds um, like creative writing lessons. Um, and because I never had confidence in myself, like going back to the confidence idea that I didn't have that in myself before seeing kind of people like me being able to do all this, um, but also just um, your technical skills and the even now when you talked about your writing process, um, it's nice to see that it all sort of starts from nothing and you don't have to have everything figured out from the beginning, which can be a lot of pressure. Um, yeah, definitely very inspiring. So thank you for those beautiful answers. Um, I'm gonna try to hold it together because I and the rest of the chat is just completely emotional at how amazing you all are. Um, so the next set of questions I have is gonna be for everyone, including Nora. So folks, feel free to sort of chime in as you see fit. 
Um, so the first question is, how can speculative fiction like sci-fi and fantasy expand our understanding of real, real world issues? Um, for me, I feel like fiction helped me understand the real world in my own dreams, because I feel like it's just some it, fiction is just like something you think is not real, but like it's real somehow, like thinking about writing and all that. I feel like I know what my dreams are and I know what I'm looking for in life, even though it's not something that is going to be easy just being able to imagine about something else, just being able to see myself in a world where things is different than this world that we have now. I, I know where I wanna be and what I wanna go through and what am I gonna do to make my dreams come true. And so I feel like fiction is, it's not any different than what the world is. It's just that you think of it and it's not in the real world. Um, I think for me, um, speculative fiction has always been a way to explore ideas of the real world, but just in a different format um, or in a safer way. Um, a lot of times when I read, I think it helps me to step into other people's shoes um, through reading about different perspectives and different experiences and different um, lives. Um, and I think in general, for all of us, um, just reading about different people's way of life, but, um, even if it's fictional, even if it's um, an alien three worlds away, um, I think can help us kind of get out of our own head of the main character complex that I think a lot of us have hold that kind of the world revolves around us and everything we think is right, um, because when, at least for me, um, when I read speculative fiction or fiction in general, um, it helps me understand people in real life better that, oh, they have their own story too that need to be told and need to be heard. I feel like also with speculative fiction, um, sometimes in the world we live in today, we kind of forget how to dream and it really does inspire us. And I don't know how to say it, but you, you get what I'm saying, just helps us expand our minds and understand the subconscious. And as well as Afra and Amali Neda said, just understand the world around us. And, you know, we forget that we have the power to change it with all the bad things that are going on in the world you know, our, our views and what we're doing right now seems so insignificant, but we really do have some kind of power. Whoops, okay, I was muted. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree with um, everything you guys are saying. Um, you know, I, the thing that um, kept hitting me when I was younger. Um, and I, I kept thinking to myself, you know, it's, it's not that important that I see people like myself or people other than, you know, sort of the typical, uh, cishet white dude, American middle class, blah, blah, blah in the future. Um, you know, it's not that crucial because, you know, we're all human. We can all, uh, equate with other people, but, but there was a message being communicated by the fact that I wasn't seeing um, those other stories being told, um, those, those other faces telling those stories. Um, and the message being communicated was that it was not for you, it was not for me. Um, you know, and I, I think often of uh, Chimamanda Adichie's uh, Dangers of a Single Story, if you have not um, watched that TED talk uh, of hers. Um, where she talks about the fact that, you know, if you are only ever seeing um, one kind of story, then you start to believe that that's the only kind of story that can exist. Um, it, it boundaries you. I don't know if boundaries is a verb or should be used as a verb. I'm going to declare it a verb. Um, but, you know, it, it, it restricts and constricts you and, and you begin to think that that's all there is. So... Thank you for those answers. Um, 
So the next question I have is about time and the fact that cities can shift pretty drastically um, over time. So if we think about New York City, 100 years ago in 1921, the city was very different, right? Um, the Empire State Building had it been built, uh, the Chrysler Building had it been built, uh, the subway was only about two decades old, and it was only recently that all of the pieces of the city sort of came together to become New York City. And so, you know, acknowledging that a lot can happen over the course of 100 years, um, how do you all think the city might change from 20, 2021 to uh, 2121? So looking 100 years into the future. And um, if you want to take it even further, how, how might the city change 200 years in the future? What might this landscape look or feel like um, in that future? Um. For me, I feel like I was trying to think realistic about it. I feel like I I dreamed of a lot of robots and jobs being more technology than by hand. And like, I feel like a lot of people would have to know a, um, a little bit about computers and coding and all that to kind of find a job that has very high paid and all that. Because I feel like the world is kind of getting weird everything like people don't really want to do things by hands anymore even i get lazy when i when i imagine about how much i could just buy a Uber and they do all that for me and so yeah well it's it, it is super hard to look into the future 100 years when you know i don't know what i'm gonna do tomorrow what i'm you know what i'm gonna eat for breakfast um but I feel like in the future, maybe we'll have more efficient subway trains and stations. Hopefully we'll be able to take care of the amount of waste we carry in the city, but very unlikely. Um, I, just, I just want the city to be a safe place and for the people to be safe. And I hope that will change in the future. Um, I think for us to realistically survive as a human race, I think um, the city would have to become a lot more greener, um, like and environmentally friendly, um, with like, I don't know, gardens on roofs, because we have enough buildings for that. Um, and a lot more trees and plants. And I think that could make New York City a lot more beautiful. Um, but I don't know, I think it's maybe a bit pessimistic, but realistically, it's sometimes difficult to think positively about the future, um, especially considering the state of our world right now and the state of our politics even. Um, and especially for us, I think, young generation who kind of bears the responsibility of fixing this world, it can be difficult to think of this bright, positive future when we know what we have to do but that can also be taken as a positive thing because i think we have a lot of potential and we definitely want to solve all the issues so i mean i i take a lot of heart from the idea that um human beings are so numerous that I don't honestly think that we can wipe ourselves out. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who believe that there is no, um, that our future is limited or that our future is going to turn into this weird Mad Max thing. Um, I mean, and it's possible, but you know, human beings um, are resilient and cooperative. And um, if we can manage to shake off our current uh, various political, infections, um, then, then I do think that the city will become kind of a wild and wondrous place. Um, you know, I take a lot of heart from, from reading, um, I did a recent reread of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents. Um, and if you have not read those books, they are hella depressing. Um, they posit a world that is so much worse than, I mean, you know, it's our world time dialed up to 11 and it's all bad 11. Um, and yet towards the end of the second book, you start to see that the world recovers um, because, you know, 
bad times don't last forever. These things are cyclical. Um, and, you know, there will be at some point improvement. Um, so I, I want to believe that at some point, it may take a while, but at some point, New York will get itself together, um, figure out that, hey, the sea level's rising, maybe we should build uh, berms or dams or something. Um, you know, uh, we have too many cars on the streets and, and we're all choking on exhaust. Maybe we should actually fix the subway instead of talking about fixing it and thinking about fixing it and breathing on it and hoping that that will somehow magically cause it to fix itself. Anyway, um, I don't want to start getting real raw here, but, um, but I, you know, human societies tend to gravitate towards large habitations because of our economic system. I don't know if that's gonna always happen, um, but I think the city will be the city for you know several hundred years at least. Um, and I think that it will grow and improve and um, be a better, healthier place to live a hundred years from now. I'm gonna speak that into existence and hope that it becomes. Thank you for speaking that into existence. Um, so I have one more question and then I wanna open it up for audience Q and A. Um, so Nora, in The City We Became, you wrote, there ain't one way to be part of the city. And so I wanna ask um, you all, um, what does it mean for you all to be part of New York City? What, what do you think it means to be part of New York City? You guys first. Uh um, I feel like for me, I would say like being in New York City is like being part of a family where they kind of disagree with your decision and you have to stand up for yourself and at the same time not trying to hurt them just because you think your decision is better than theirs. I feel like you just have to think of them and think of yourself and take the best decision for both of you. And so I feel like being in New York City, you just have to always be thinking up high and just not be like everybody's wrong, just like see the point of everybody else's, yeah. Right, just like Amali Nada said, it's a very fast paced city and you can't be naive in the city. And I'm not saying that it's a scary, it, you can't see it as a scary place because there's amazing things about it. But to be a New Yorker, you gotta really be like cautious and there's just, kind of like this, I don't know, hostility that comes with being a New Yorker that I feel like is really useful when going to other places, but just being there and <laughs> protecting yourself is most important in the city, I feel. Um, I think for me, it's a pretty, um, cause I'm an immigrant and I've only lived here for five years. So, um, I don't know, I think I have a unique experience to the city, um, a short one as well. Um, but to me, I think being a New Yorker is noticing uh, all the lovely things around the city that aren't the tourist spots always. To me, it is taking the early morning train to school and seeing everyone bundled up in coats, dozing off in their seats and holding on to the poles. Um, it is going to Brooklyn and seeing the colorful graffiti on the building walls and sidewalks, seeing the Hudson River outside of my school and going to coffee shops with my friends a block away. Um, it is the thrift stores and delis and the sunset peeking out behind the Empire State Building. It is how Manhattan looks at nighttime from the bridge, lights looking like sprinkled stars. I think to be a part of the city, it means to love the sunset behind the skyline and to love the little things that makes this city so wonderful, despite, you know, the self-isolation we are in right now. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how I can follow that. That was poetic and beautiful. Um, well, I mean, I think, We've just heard three completely different experiences of the city and attitudes toward the city and feelings about the city. And that's the nature of cities. You know, it's where we're several million individuals each having our own experience kind of united by some common events. And, you know, that's, that's human, human life. We are, we are, uh, um, 
social species. And when we form into cities, um, there is a kind of power in that, um, which I decided to put into a novel. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, even just like over the course of my lifetime, New York has, it, it is a conversation. Um, it is us in communication with the city and the city being kind of in communication with us. New York has changed so much over my life. Like I remember when I was you guys age, uh, well, maybe a little younger, um, uh, walking across the Williamsburg Bridge with my father. And before, uh, I think it got renovated in like the late 90s. Um, but before that point, the Williamsburg Bridge had giant holes in it. Um, and you would walk on the pedestrian pathway and there would be a big hole. And the hole was big enough literally to fall through. And below were cars and you would die. Um, and I thought this was the greatest thing ever. This to me felt like, like a, a sort of metaphor for New York. Life in this city consists of, you know, walking along, watching your step, risking death at any given moment. But meanwhile, look at this view. <laughs> and meanwhile, smell that wonderful summer breeze, you know, coming off the polluted water that might catch fire. You know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, there, there was just, it was this constant conversation of beauty and horror. Um, and New York has not changed. You know, the balance of beauty to horror is always shifting slightly, but those two components are always there. Um, so anyway. Thank you all for those answers. Um, so the first question I wanted to um, pull from the audience is a question for Nora. So the question is, how do you protect your piece while being highly visible in the sci-fi book world? Um, you know, acknowledging the fact that we're living in a world that's just uh, embedded with white supremacy, patriarchy, homophobia. Um, you know, how do you protect your peace and how do you pr protect your emotional well-being while being so visible in space? Well, I mean, there's the practical side of that, which is um, I have done a number of things to kind of try and guard my uh, privacy online. Uh, I'm careful about what I say and how I say it. Um, like I, you know, never mention, you know, I'm going to be in this neighborhood on this street at this time. Um, you know, when I, when I do public events, um, I often don't announce them until relatively short time beforehand because, um, you know, that, that gives bad actors less time to act, um, you know, and things like that. Um, there's the, the piece of it where lately I have just kind of backed off of social media. Um, I was really never super, like I, there was, you know, all of the, the old heads on Twitter will tell you that once upon a time Twitter was fun and then the Fire Nation attacked. I'm sorry, I'm kidding. Anyway, um, but uh, yes, I love that show. Um, but anyway, um, but things have changed and, and you know, it's time to recognize that things have changed beyond the point of enjoyability. And I, you know, being a, a very visible person and, and, you know, I guess I've reached a point now where I don't feel like I need it anymore. So I pop on Twitter, I make my announcements for the day, maybe I react to something I see, but then I go um, and, and I've been feeling like a lot better since I started doing that. You know, that's only been a few months, but I had already been kind of weaning myself off of it. Um, but then there's the, um, there's the sort of psychological piece of that. Um, and I will say that, you know, they say that living well is the best revenge. Um, when you are dealing with bigots who protest your inclusion in a space or your existence period, um, and, and they constantly try and imply that you don't belong there because you're not good enough, you're not whatever, um, and then you become a bestseller, then you feel better. So yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. Um, 
So the next question is kind of um, related to something that you and Megan were talking about earlier. Um, the fact that you never really intended to become a professional writer, but over time you sort of made that transition. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to um, what that transition was like and when you realized that your writing, you know, passion could become your full-time career. Um, well, I turned 30 and had my first midlife crisis. Uh, and, and anybody who is older than 30 who hears me say that, I hear myself say that and I wanna slap myself, but um, because a midlife crisis at 30 is ridiculous. But, um, you know, but you know, like a lot of young people, I'd kind of grown up hearing that, you know, when you turn 30, your life is over. You suddenly babies appear and your career ends and, you know, or your career becomes that much harder or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know what it is, but uh, something about the way that we raise young people in this country encourages them to think that as soon as their 20s are over, their life has ended. Um, and so I hit 30 um, and had this momentary crisis um, and I was, you know, doing okay, but not great. I was living in Boston. I didn't like Boston. Um, I had student loans out the wazoo. Uh, I had a good job, but it was in a town that I didn't like, um, you know, and so on. And I, I started to look at ways that I, you know, basically turning 30 was the moment where I was like, I don't like my life. I want to fix it. What do I do to fix it? Um, and I'd always been writing. My writing was my outlet. Um, and I'd never thought of making a career out of it. But I began to think around that time, but maybe... Um, I could at least make a little extra money, get myself out of debt a few years earlier. Um, and so I decided to try uh, at that point to pursue the idea of becoming a professional writer. You never go into writing expecting to make a lot of money. I was looking for like utilities money or like, you know, bill, bill pay, bill subsidy money, um, bills money. <laughs> and um, I, you know, I was like, if I can just make bills money every so often, I'll be okay. This will help a whole lot. Um, and so I went to a writer's workshop. Uh, I joined a writing group. I began writing short stories and we would submit them to each other um, and try and improve them. And then we would start submitting them to magazines and things like that. Um, we encouraged each other. Uh, with this writing group, uh, you know, among other things, we talked about the rejections that we got. Um, and there were lots of rejections. And we owned the fact that rejection is part of the process of becoming a writer. The more rejections you get, the more of a writer you become. Um, you, obviously, you want more than rejections, but the rejections are part of it. Um, and just slowly but surely, I, I got better. And, uh, you know, I started to actually publish and things proceeded from there. Thank you. So this uh, last question is going to be for everyone because everybody, um, you know, in our panel um, are creative and writers. And this question is about um, what advice do you have for someone who's questioning their creative work? So people who might be feeling doubt about their practice. Um, what advice do the four of you have sort of how to overcome that? Well, you can't knock it till you try it. And I've had those similar thoughts too, where, you know, I'm afraid to write because maybe it's just not meant for me or maybe I, I'm not good. And, you know, you can't really get good unless you try and you practice. You can't hone your craft without putting in the hours and the effort. And that will take some time, that will take some sweat, tears, et cetera. But, you know, you have to push yourself and you have to give it time. You have to be patient with yourself because we don't know how much time we have in this world or, you know, we don't know how limited our souls or our lives will be. But until then, you know, aren't you going to be happy with yourself that, you know, at, at least you gave it a try. And I think that's the most beautiful part about it. Yeah, oh, that was beautiful. Um, I think <laughs> for um, me, I kind of use a, the same method for writing as I do for art. Um, when 
I paint to get better at painting. It can be difficult to have faith in yourself um, because you make something and you don't have faith in it, which kind of goes for writing as well. And something that I found out, I think in seventh grade maybe, was that if I was drawing things that I enjoy, um, if I was drawing characters off of a show or celebrities I admire, um, no matter how bad it might look to me, I still liked the finished piece. And that I started applying to writing after that, um, where sure, it wasn't how I imagined in my head and it wasn't maybe up to the critics, but I took a blank page and created something onto it. And um, like that itself is so incredible. The fact that we all can just do that. We can take this blank page and just put our thoughts onto it. And now it just exists as a creation is fantastic to me. Um, so even if it doesn't become New York Times bestseller, <laughs> it still is there, exists some like a proof that I thought of something that was incredible or a proof that I lived <laughs> in a way. Um, and that itself, I think, should be enough motivation to write. Um, I would say like nobody's born with the ability to walk and talk. They had to learn it at some point. They had to be a baby and grow up and learn. And so I feel like it is important to put time into what you want to be. So like, don't just feel like, because I want to be a writer, I'm just gonna sit down here and just write something out of nothing. Like, you're gonna have to walk through it. You're gonna have to think about it and find ideas that felt like good. And then tomorrow waking up that it's boring. You know, you feel like it's boring, you need new things. And I feel like it's good to just go through your ideas and just write what you feel. Even though tomorrow you wake up, it, it's not really what you wanted. Just keep it. It's in you. It came from you and it's still going to be you at some point. Yeah. Um, I think one of the Im most important things that you can do to create is live. Just simply live your life meet as many people as you can, get to know them as deeply as they will let you, um, reveal yourself as much as you are comfortable um, and connect with those people and connect with the world around you. The stories write themselves when you do that. Um, I have never, you know, I've, I've had a uh, writer's block where I've like struggled to actually get like actual work done, um, but I've never been short of ideas. Um, you know, there's this thing that happens when you become a professional writer um, where you go to parties and random strangers are like, I've got this great idea for a book that you could write. I'm gonna share you this idea. I'll give you my idea if you write the book. Um, and you know, any professional writer is gonna tell you, we, we have our own ideas. That's not, we don't need anybody else's ideas. Um, it's literally just a matter of taking it from your head and putting it on paper. Um, you're doing the main work here, regardless of whether the, the page is blank or not, the work is already being done. Um, so now I'm rambling. So I just wanna say thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Molly Nada. Thank you, Afra. Thank you, Nora, for those incredibly rich and thoughtful and vulnerable answers. Um, I feel like I always learn things when I talk to folks from the Octavia Project. And Nora, thank you so much for joining us again. Um, I am just blown away. And so um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Ray, who's gonna help us um, close the night and just um, wrap up the evening. So thank you again, all. Yeah, uh, thank you again. Much like Daphne, I'm, I'm also um, amazed by this conversation and reflecting on like my experiences, like as an educator, as an artist, and also just as a person like sort of moving through the world. Um, but before we close for the evening, I'd like to thank a few more people on behalf of the Octavia Project. Um, of course, first, uh, thank you to N.K. Jemison for um, her continued support of our mission and participating in this event. 
Um, we also want to thank Octavia Project participants Afra, Amalineda, and Kaylee for joining us, Greenlight Bookstore for hosting us, and the Octavia Project Advisory Board for organizing tonight's event. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did, and the chat clearly shows that. Um, and we will continue, um, and will continue to help us grow our network by telling your friends and family about our work. As you can see, we push our participants to think about the future in different ways. They're curious, intelligent, thoughtful, and bold. Octavia Project participants learn new skills and build confidence during our summer institute. But most importantly, they create a supportive and welcoming community. You can learn more about the Octavia Project by following us on social media or going to our website. If you would like to support us with a donation, you can do so at octaviaproject.org support. We will be announcing raffle prize winners via email. Um, so please make sure to check your email to see if you have won. Thank you again for joining us and have a good night. Stay well.